bringing you the latest in tax credit news, this is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the June 6th, 2023 podcast. This year has been an exciting period for introducing legislation aimed at expanding and or improving affordable housing and community development tax incentives, such as the Long Buzzing Tax Credit, New Markets Tax Credit, Historic Tax Credit, the Opportunity Zones Incentive, and more. This makes today's episode one of interest for just about everyone who works with these tax incentives, including developers, owners, investors, lenders, and syndicators. The Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, one recent noteworthy bill, was introduced last month. The Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act was brought forth in both houses of Congress and aims to expand and strengthen the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which is the strongest tool in the nation for financing the creation and renovation of affordable rental housing. But that bill is just the tip of the legislative iceberg. In preparing for this podcast, we at Novogratik identified a selection of bills that have been introduced or will be soon on the federal level this year that could affect the low visibility tax credit, the new markets tax credit, historic tax credit, and opportunity zones. Novogratik engaged with the members of each of these communities through our working groups to help provide guidance and advice on the shape these bills might take. We also help clients prepare for possible changes should these bills or provisions from these bills become law. Now, joining me for today's discussion about the various pieces of legislation is Peter Lawrence, Novogratik's Director of Public Policy and Government Relations. Peter has frequently joined me on the podcast to discuss legislation and other happenings in Washington, D.C. If you're a frequent listener to this podcast, you've heard Peter many times. Now, most significant for today's episode, Peter advises each of our working groups and briefs them on what's happening in both the legislative and regulatory fronts. His monthly briefs to each working group is considered the highlight of each meeting for many of the members. And we have a lot we're going to cover today. So if you're ready, let's get started. Peter, welcome back to Nashville Tuesday. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to be back. And it's always a privilege to have you back. Uh, as I noted, Peter works out of our Washington, D.C. office and has his finger on the pulse of Congress and the rest of the federal government when it comes to a broad swath of issues in which Novogratik is engaged. So, Peter, if you could start by telling our listeners more about the work you do in Washington as head of Novogratik's Public Policy and Government Relations Group. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, you know, one of the main ways uh, that we work uh, in D.C. here in the Capitol is as part of the various working groups you mentioned. And I'll, we'll talk about them in more detail, but you know, typically we meet monthly, but also have uh, email updates, uh, timely ones based on what's happening in DC. In between those monthly meetings, we prepare all sorts of uh, uh, briefing materials as part of those working groups that uh, actionable items for uh, stakeholders that they, they can use uh, both to realize what's going on in DC, how the various policies are changing the tax incentives, as well as what might be coming down the line uh, in, in the future. And so we certainly encourage you to uh, reach out if you're interested in joining any of those working groups. But that's not all. You know, one thing, uh, just yesterday, I was spent a fair amount of time uh, uh, meeting on uh, key Senate offices, uh, also do the same on the House, pr primarily the uh, Ways and Means uh, and Senate Finance Committees, where which are the two you know tax writing committees uh, in Congress, uh, and uh, you know we also meet with uh, key uh, financials and federal agencies, both the Treasury and HUD and others. We find out what's going on. We advise them, give input on uh, proposals. Uh, directly with them, we engage them. And then, of course, uh, also, we participate in a wide variety of policy coalitions. You know, a lot of what happens in D.C. are like-minded uh, coalitions, like, you know, the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition, the Housing Advisory Group, New Markets Tax Credit Coalition, Partnership for Job Creations, just a sampling of the types of policy-led coalitions that we are active uh, in to advance the, the key uh, public policies for the areas in which we practice. So uh, there's a lot to do here. Uh, even when 
you know, that Congress may not be terribly active. There's always something going on here in D.C. Well, I like the fact that you emphasize both the legislative and regulatory fronts, because depending upon when Congress is divided, the regulatory fronts can be a lot more significant, which is a potential. But obviously, when even with divided Congress, there's a, a lot of opportunity for legislative victories. Uh, so our listeners can tell, uh, Peter, that you're very engaged in what happens at Capitol Hill when it comes to affordable housing and community development tax incentives. So I thought we would start, if you could just list at a very high level, the most notable pieces of legislation that have been introduced or we expect to be introduced soon during this 118th Congress. And after you discuss the various pieces of legislation at a super high level, we'll then dig down and go into each one individually in more detail. Uh, sure thing. So uh, starting off with the one you mentioned previously and uh, one of the, the, the primary low-income housing tax credit legislation is the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which was recently introduced. It's already gotten over 100 co-sponsors in the House and, wow. and 16 in the Senate. So there's still, uh, uh, you know, it's a, that's a great start. A lot more to come on that. Uh, also, uh, in, on the light tech front, there's the Decent Affordable Safe Housing Act uh, from uh, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Wyden. There's, and in that, there's also his middle income housing tax credit proposal, which we understand may, will be introduced separately uh, sometime soon. Uh, there's the Neighborhood Homes Investment Tax Credit, which is both in DASH and has been introduced separately as a uh, a bill in both the House and the Senate, or sorry, in the House, it will be soon. <laughs> my my apologies there. Uh, um, and and then there's also the the Visible Inclusive Tax Credits for Accessible Living or Vital Act, which is uh, uh, a bill designed to try to get uh, to encourage uh, more uh, housing credit development for uh, accessible or visitable units. Uh, and then out uh, stepping away from Alitech, there's the uh, New Markets Extension Bill, or often referred to as the Permanence Bill. Uh, there's the uh, Rural Jobs Act as well. It's a part of uh, uh, New Markets. There's the Historic uh, Tax Growth and Opportunity Act, which has been the longstanding uh, consensus historic tax credit legislation. And then there's the Opportunity Zones Transparency and Extension Improvement Act. Uh, there's other Opportunity Zones bills, but this is the major one led by, uh, you know, uh, Senators Booker and Tim Scott. Great. Thank you for that, Peter. And to our listeners, I would just note, most of these bills have been introduced. You know, not all of them have been introduced, as Peter already uh, intimated with respect to neighbor homes. Uh, so, Peter, let's start now by going down from the high level to a little bit more uh, description of each of the various bills. I don't want to get too granular because the bills have a lot in them. And I would encourage our listeners to visit our website. Uh, we have all the different bills and through various reporting such that we've done, we've described the key points of the bill. But for purpose of our listeners, Peter, let's start with the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. If you could just discuss the key provisions that would lead to more production, more resources for affordable housing. Indeed. And we do have a blog post that goes into detail. So I encourage folks and that hopefully that can be added to the show notes as well. Uh, so on the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, there really are sort of, uh, uh, you know, three main buckets of proposals. And I guess you could consider a fourth potentially that do the most of the financing that would encourage the most in additional financing of uh, affordable rental housing. Uh, I'll start with the lowering the high activity bond financing threshold from 50% down to 25%. You know, this is a threshold that's pretty arbitrary. There's no magic to that number. It, and Congress has lowered it in the past. It would uh, uh, be make uh, it more efficient for the state as well as for the developer and using their resources. And that's the, that's the biggest primary driver of financing more units in the entire bill. There's also a proposal to increase the percent allocations. It would restore the 12.5% increase that expired back in 2021 to initially authorized in 2018. We'd hoped that would have been extended, but unfortunately, you know, last Congress for due to a variety of factors, we don't have time to go to now, but uh, that what wasn't able to happen. They we're restoring that 12 and a half percent, make it a part of the, the, the baseline going forward, and then phase in a 
two 25% increases this year and then the uh, following year. That's where we get the 50% increase in 9% allocations from. Uh, so that's uh, also a key provision in the legislation. Uh, there are three uh, proposals that sort of all act a similar way uh, to provide a basis boost for issues primarily affecting uh, bond finance properties. And that is extending the existing discretion that states have on the 9% side to provide a boost uh, to to bonds and also providing a basis boost for all rural areas, meaning non-metro counties or areas that meet USDA's definition of rural housing. Uh, and then also a basis boost for Native American areas where there are particular development challenges that really need you need that extra equity to make those deals pencil. Uh, and then uh, as another sort of uh, uh, basis boost proposal, which affects both the 9 and the 4% side, would be to provide up to a 50% basis boost for units that are serving uh, and targeted to extremely low-income households. You know, that basically essentially is a household earning uh, 30% uh, of the area meet income or the federal poverty line. And so those are the, the main elements. And we've done this analysis of the bill. And when you combine all of those provisions, we estimate uh, nearly 2 million uh, units could be financed over 10 years. Great. Thank you for that. That's a lot of units that could be financed if the bill was passed. I would just note that the 30% basis boost, you mentioned several different provisions, but they're not additive. Uh, there are, you, you get if any one of them would get you up to 30%, correct? Correct. Absolutely. And as is always the case, it's still up to state underwriting, you know, that, that you don't need that full 30% uh, basis boost to have your deal pencil, uh, the states won't give it to you. So they'll, they'll still do that, that underwriting check. Yes. They have that financial feasibility requirement. So let's move on to the next in your list. And that was the Decent Affordable Safe Housing for All, or the DASH Act, introduced by a chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Ron Wyden from Oregon. And what are the key pieces of that bill that you think our listeners should be aware of? Yeah, that is, that is the uh, Senate Finance Committee Chairman Wyden's sort of very comprehensive housing legislation that really uh, addresses everything from housing for the homeless all the way up to, uh, you know, uh, single family home ownership for first time home buyers. It's uh, a very comprehensive piece of legislation and sort of represents here are all the priorities of Chairman Wyden when it comes to housing. And he's as chairman of the finance committee, he's in a very influential uh, position to, to advance that. Primarily, we really focus on the tax side, although there, there are also some spending side proposals there. Uh, and you know, it starts, of course, with the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. And I'll just note, by the way, that you know, Chairman Wyden is the second lead Democratic co-sponsor behind uh, Senator Cantwell of Washington on the bill. Uh, so it makes sense that you know, he's very much on board of that. And he's always said, you know, uh, that uh, any legislation, housing tax legislation he's pushed, well, he's going to primarily focus first with the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act and then try to get as much else from his bill that it, he can, uh, depending on the opportunity. Um, there are a couple of uh, low-income housing tax credit provisions that are not in the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act that are in DASH, and that is uh, reform of the right of first refusal. Uh, provision uh, and also similar reform of the qualified contract uh, option. And uh, we don't have time to go into those, but certainly we can, we can always reach out if you're interested to learn more about those. Uh, but they are not uh, at, at have as much bipartisan support as the rest of the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. So I think there's a that's an important reason why they're not included there. Um, but they are priorities of of, of Chairman Wyden. Uh, there's also, uh, in the housing realm, the uh, middle income housing tax credit proposal, which really is Chairman Wyden's, uh, proposal to try to address, uh, the needs of folks who are just above the traditional housing credit, uh, income limits. And there's, that's a growing problem in the country. Uh, we, as we continue not to produce enough housing, uh, it's not just the lowest income households, which admittedly there are great needs there. Uh, but also the ones just above 
uh, the, the, the income limits that also are in great need. And this would be a new helpful tool or toolbox, very much inspired by uh, the long-term housing task grant would operate almost essentially the same way uh, with, with just a very few small differences and less subsidy, of course, uh, given you have the higher rents, uh, but very important tool. And we've worked very closely with uh, Chairman Wyden on the development of that proposal, and we continue to do so. Uh, and then there's the neighborhood at homes uh, uh, tax credit uh, proposal, which, as I mentioned, has been introduced as uh, separate legislation. It's the it, it also inspired by the low income housing tax credit, but to address the need to develop uh, single family housing for ownership uh, in distressed neighborhoods, where you know the cost of acquisition and rehabilitation or construction uh, of uh, uh, owner occupied housing costs more than what the properties are worth and what could they could be sold for. Uh, so it addresses that gap in there. And it's an important new tool that has gotten uh, a lot of support uh, across Congress and, and, the, and the country. So an impressive coalition behind it as well. Uh, and then there's also a renter tax credit proposal uh, that I think, you know, is really uh, Chairman Wyden's desire to try to do housing vouchers through the tax code, which you may ask, well, why would you just do housing vouchers? Well, you know, we've got challenges in trying to increase uh, the discretionary budget. Uh, we had the debt ceiling we just recently got through uh, the Congress that uh, has curtailed discretionary spending. It's really challenging. It's often sometimes more possible to increase more resources on the tax side. And so Chairman Wyden, in trying to get more you know, housing voucher type resources, has introduced the idea of a renter tax credit. And then there, of course, there are traditional spending proposals like increasing the housing trust fund, increasing vouchers, and uh, rural housing provisions in it. So very, very comprehensive piece of legislation. Yeah, that is, it's quite comprehensive. I would encourage listeners to spend a little more time looking through the revisions. It's a nice little canvas as to what might be possible on the tax incentive and spending fronts to provide more resources for affordable housing. So as part of that bill, uh, there is also included in the DASH Act, the Middle Income Housing Tax Credit and the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. As you mentioned, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act has been introduced in uh, one uh, half of Congress. And uh, Middle Income Housing Tax Credit, we expect sometime soon. It's always hard to know when soon is. Can you describe a little bit about both of those? We have a date actually on that. It's uh, June 8th, which is uh, two days after this podcast will air. As we expect, that's what the, the, the leaders of the House have told us. They are planning to introduce uh, the legislation. Uh, and we and I think they're trying to get a few uh, uh, nice, strong core group of original co-sponsors uh, uh, before they officially introduce. Uh, you know, we understand it's going to be uh, the same as the bill in the Senate, which has been already introduced by uh, uh, Senators Ben Cardin of Maryland and Todd Young, so the lead Republican co-sponsor of the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. He's been leading on both big housing tax credit bills this Congress. We do think that there's a great promise of this uh, proposal. We have a, a working group that's designed to address the uh, issues and how to make this uh, proposal work best. You know, I think some people think we do only set up working groups for things that are actually already enacted. That's not true with opportunity zones. We had a working group before it was enacted and we helped design it as it was, the legislation was developed. Uh, we helped to uh, work as an advisor on that front and we hope we're doing the same thing on uh, neighborhood homes uh, so that we can get, if it is enacted by Congress, we are ready to sort of, uh, you know, run with the proposal and get it implemented as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, and then, you know, and same thing with the middle income housing tax credit. One sort of thing I'll just note uh, the proposal that we expect to be reintroduced uh, as a set separate standalone proposal on a bipartisan basis is going to be a slightly different from what we've seen over the uh, previous iterations of this proposal. Uh, I think one of the uh, innovations is uh, instead of uh, in the past, you would have the separate pool of authority that you could use only for the middle income population. Uh, it, for the first year, the states had that, and then the second year it would flow over into the state's uh, low-income housing tax credit ceiling. I think the, the change that we anticipate 
to happen is states could have this separate pool that from day one, if they wanted to, they could use it for traditional uh, long-term housing tax credit for purposes, but at their own discretion, they wanted to use it to serve that slightly higher. They could do that with that slightly lo lower, lower level of uh, subsidy given the higher rents you can charge those units. So that's a slight change and uh, please keep an eye out uh, or reach out to us uh, for updates on it. For so thank you for that, Peter. The last item that's really targeted towards affordable housing uh, is a bit of a more narrowly designed bill, and that's the Vital Act. Maybe you could describe briefly what listeners should know about the Vital Act. Right. The Vital Act has a couple of actually provisions from the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act to increase uh, housing credit resources, but it also uh, has elements that are designed to get more of the units that are financed by the housing credit to be accessible and visitable. Uh, it also creates a national council to advise uh, state agencies on how to best address uh, needs of uh, accessibility, uh, visibility, uh, as well as a national resource center to help find best practices. I'm not sure that this bill will necessarily advance anytime uh, uh, soon, but I think what it what really demonstrates to me, Mike, is that it, People view low-income housing tax credit as this key tool to solve all sorts of problems. Uh, and that's just one of them. There's all these other various things that's already being yes. used to try to help solve. And so I think that's a, uh, a great sign that Congress says, you know, when, when they have a problem to solve, they look to the housing credit to be a key part of that. And so that's my main takeaway there. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next, I wanted to move into the, the New Markets Tax Credit Extension Act, one of the uh, bills that you mentioned, but before that, I just wanted to note to our listeners, you know, as we go into each of these various incentives, we have the long term tax credit and the lead bill there is a four housing credit improvement act. I want to emphasize that it has strong bipartisan support in both the house and the Senate, uh, the new market tax credit uh, extension act, similarly, you know, strong bipartisan support in the house and the Senate. And when we get to the historic tax credit bill, the opportunity loans bill, you'll also see there's bipartisan support in the house and the Senate. And the bills that don't deal with existing credits, but credits that we uh, are working to get enacted, the Middle Income Housing Tax Credit and Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, uh, we have strong bipartisan and uh, bicameral support. Uh, and it, and to the extent that we are trying to bolster it, we're working to ensure that there's strong bipartisan and bicameral support for these bills. So I, I, uh, might be obvious to many folks. I know it's obvious to you and me, Peter, <laughs> but I always like to emphasize the uh, bipartisan and bicameral support. Um, and I also wanted to note before we move to new market tax credit is that various housing bills that we've discussed, once again, the Four Housing Credit Improvement Act, the DASH Act, the Middle Income Housing Tax Credit, the Neighborhood Health Investment Act, and the Vital Act. These are all topics of discussion that we're gonna include in our conference on September 28th and 29th. That's being held in New Orleans. It's the Novograd 2023 Housing Tax Credit and Bonds Conference. So with all of that as a, a bit of a segue from housing related legislation to more broader community development related legislation, maybe you could describe the key provisions of the New Market Tax Credit Extension Act, which is it really an extension act? <laughs> it's a permanency act. Indeed. I think most people do call it the permanence bill. It has been a longstanding key piece of legislation uh, that's been uh, introduced and reintroduced in Congress uh, uh, that would uh, make uh, new markets tax credit permanent. I should just remind folks that currently it is, uh, expires in 2025. This bill would sort of take up beyond that year um, and it would set the initial allocation amount to be $5 billion uh, and then include annual inflation adjustments, just like uh, the low-income housing tax credit per capita, small state minimum, the activity bond per capita, and small state minimums will all be uh, um, increased by inflation. This The new markets allocation amount would also be uh, adjusted by inflation annually. And one key policy uh, provision is it would allow the new markets tax credit to be taken against the alternative minimum tax liability, uh, just like the low-income housing tax credit, the historic tax credit can, uh, uh, you know, th this would be a really key way. It would be particularly powerful 
for new markets to help bring in uh, a new class of investors uh, um, um, and to be interested in, in, in this credit and, and the investments that it makes. I just want to note that we are really excited to uh, ha host uh, House Ways and Means Committee Chairman uh, Jason Smith uh, at our uh, New Markets Conference this week, uh, where we hope to hear all this, all the developments and what his plans are uh, for uh, to use all the tax legislation, new markets, and perhaps others uh, um, uh, at the conference. So certainly look forward to seeing many of you out there. Yeah, thanks for mentioning uh, Chairman Smith uh, joining us at the New Market Pastor Conference uh, later this week. I do look forward to the Q&A with him. And it's, it's always interesting to hear what the chairman of a tax writing committee has to say. So it'll, I know that uh, we'll have strong attendance at that session. I did want to also- a great supporter of the New Markets Tax Credit, which is, I think, you know, it's the first time in some time now that we've had a, a top Republican in the Ways and Means Committee be such a strong uh, supporter of the New Markets Credit. That's a great, great development. And we're really excited to, to have them at the conference and to be a leader uh, on the New Markets Tax Credit among the others. Well, maybe you could even mention his role with the Rural Jobs Act and prior Congresses. Yeah, indeed. Uh, we we didn't list that on the, on the uh, list of bills, but uh, the Rural Jobs Act would create a se separate pool of uh, new markets uh, allocation authorities targeted to rural areas, especially those that are persistently poor. Uh, and uh, you know, he's re he's been the leader of that bill uh, ever since it was introduced, and we do expect it to be uh, uh, introduced in the House sometime soon. Uh, it has been introduced in the Senate. Uh, or it's got some good, strong uh, bipartisan support uh, there. Um, but uh, uh, so we expect to hear more about that at the conference. And and uh, certainly it is could be in play uh, later this year as well. And I would just know when you mentioned the new market tax credit being able to offset the empty liability if this bill was enacted as is, uh, that would open it up for individual investors uh, to invest in new market tax credit. So that would be an attractive group of additional investors to bring in uh, to increase the the sort of average or median equity uh, credit pricing. Uh, that that provision would kick in earlier than twenty twenty five too, so that would you would have a more immediate effect to to the to the credit. Yes, and as I mentioned, uh, with uh, Chairman Smith speak at the New Market Task Conference later this week, just to be specific, it's the 2023 Spring New Market Task Force Conference, uh, and it's this Thursday and Friday at the Fremont Hotel at Washington, D.C. So now let's moving on from new markets. Let's go to historic tax credits. And if you could share with our listeners some of the key provisions that are proposed in the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act, often referred to as the HTC GO Act. Indeed, yes, this is the long-standing legislation on the historic tax credit uh, that uh, we've been championing uh, for uh, um, several Congresses now. Uh, and there's the, the, that has legislation has been introduced in the House and Senate. There's a small difference between the two bills. The difference here on the HTC Go is that there's a uh, temporary increase uh, to uh, the uh, uh, historic tax credit to 30% for uh, a few years, and then it would phase down back down to 20%. And this is really, I think, to, in recognition that inflation and the pandemic has affected supply chains and the ability and the cost to do historic rehabilitation work. And so the House leaders uh, wanted to uh, make sure that we had that uh, extra amount to try to address the need for additional financing in light of that. In addition to that temporary bump uh, uh, to 30%, both the House and Senate bills have uh, a permit increase to 30% for small projects, because typically, you know, you still have the same fixed costs associated with the rehabilitation, but to have that ability to have a higher credit amount makes deals in small rural talent centers uh, more financially feasible. And so uh, that's uh, in both bills. It would also, in both bills, would re lower the substantial rehab uh, threshold from 100% to 50% of basis, which basically just means uh, a property doesn't need to be completely falling down in order to to get make use of the full uh, uh, credit. You could, uh, you know, 
properties that don't need such as high level of rehab could be eligible. Uh, it would eliminate the historic tax credit basis adjustment, which uh, you know does would help uh, increase investor interest uh, in uh, the historic tax credits uh, and uh, is give a policy parity with the local housing tax credit. Um, and then there are also reforms that tax exempt use rules for a variety of reasons that that uh, would help facilitate the use of the historic tax credit in certain types of, of projects. It's a long-standing comprehensive bill. We understand there's lots of historic tax credit advocates that will be coming to town uh, uh, this month to push for that piece of legislation. So thank you for that, Peter. And I'll note for our listeners, as you know, we'll be discussing more about the historic tax credits this October 12th and 13th at our historic tax credit conference. That's going to be held in Charlotte, North Carolina this year. And we'll include links to that conference, as well as the uh, New Markets Conference and the Forbosing Conference that we've mentioned uh, already in the podcast. We'll include those in the show notes for today's episode. So the last piece of legislation that I would like for you to chat about, Peter, is the Opportunity Zones Transparency Extension Improvement Act. And if you could share with our listeners, what are some of the key parts of this bill that you think they should be aware of? And maybe a little bit more importantly, uh, when do you think the bill is likely to be introduced in Congress? Yeah, that is a key question people often ask. The champions of the bill, uh, Senators Cory Booker from New Jersey and uh, Tim Scott from South Carolina, have decided a slightly different tack from other champions in that they're sort of engaging with uh, the uh, Chairman Wyden uh, on, on the design uh, of the legislation uh, before introducing uh, to, to, to get uh, you know, his buy-in uh, on that. But the, the basic outlines of the legislation are that it would extend the deferral period of the uh, incentive past 2026, wh- which may seem like it's a little while away, but it's affecting uh, transactions now. Um, uh, the reinstating the reporting requirements, which is a longstanding, strong, bipartisan, bicameral you know, priority. They were just, it was originally in the Investing and Opportunities Act that authorized and established the Opportunity Zone incentives, uh, but were, you know, st- were stripped out during uh, in 2017 during because of procedural rules. Uh, it would sunset the OZ designation for census tracts with uh, median family income at or above 130 percent of the national median family income. Uh, so you know various certain you know higher income uh, OZ tracts uh, you know uh, would not be and they could be replaced by others. Um, and then it would allow, uh, you know, qualified opportunity funds to be organized as a fund as funds uh, to invest in other uh, uh, qualified opportunity zone fund, uh, qualified opportunity funds. Excuse me, uh, which you know, which essentially would enable uh, smaller communities and smaller projects to get financing uh, because it's hard to do, do that uh, uh, from uh, you know a single fund. Uh, and then it also would create a state and community dynamism fund to provide grants to uh, allow states uh, to bring more private and public capital uh, to their opportunity zones. We're keeping very close uh, attention to uh, our champions of this legislation. And you know, we do think it's going to be uh, reintroduced to be in play for whatever happens on bike general bipartisan tax legislation that moves this year, uh, but the, the timing on the bills are a little more uncertain. Well, thank you for that as well. And I will just add to our li- to inform our listeners that we at Novogratic are planning an Opportunity Zone Summit uh, this November 1st in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's scheduled to take place the day before our Renewable Energy Tax Credit Conference or Tax Incentives Conference on November 2nd and 3rd. And unfortunately, we're not quite t- we're not quite ready to take registrations, but it's something that uh, you should be aware of and be look out for. I will note if you're interested in attending, you could simply quickly take a moment to email cpas at novago.com and we'll add you to the list uh, and reach out to you directly when the registration opens up, which should be uh, soon. We've talked about a variety of uh, bills, Peter. Uh, now I wanted to segue into talking about something that probably right on the forefront of our listeners' minds, which is, this is great. <laughs> these bills are being introduced. We're getting lots of co-sponsors. What's the likelihood that these pieces are parts of these 
legislation will reach the finish line and be enacted. And as you know, and most of our listeners know, these individual tax bills are not likely to be considered on their own. They're more likely to be included or parts included in a broader, more expansive tax bill. And such larger, more expensive tax bills are usually a part of other non-tax, often non-tax must pass legislation, which is often referred to as a legislative vehicle, basically a train leaving the station that you can hitch a ride on. So Peter, what can you tell listeners about various vehicles that may be leaving the station uh, and, and also which provisions of the various tax credit bills that we've discussed are more likely to go forward if they do hitch a ride on one of these vehicles? That's a great question. Like people ask all the time, like why can't bill tax bills just advance on their own? And, you know, I won't go into the gory details about it, but it just, it's very difficult for a wide variety of reasons. And so the way typically uh, Congress deals with tax legislation is it'll graph a lot of different key priorities and add them to some, some other larger priority that Congress needs to move right now. Uh, and they'll, they'll be moved as an overall package. And that way, there's lots of stakeholders who are all pushing for this uh, uh, legislation rather than just you know, a narrow interest who may be interested in just this one bill. It's often hard to get that uh, bill with momentum uh, in that circumstance. Uh, so, But there are a couple of things we're keeping an eye on, some must-pass opportunities. You know, one of those is uh, every five years, Congress considers what's often referred to as the farm bill. Uh, it's, a, it's an authorization, reauthorization of key uh, programs uh, 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 that deal with agriculture. And, and people think, well, that sounds pretty niche to me, uh, Peter. But actually, there's a sort of an urban, suburban, rural coalition because in addition to various agricultural provisions is also the food stamps, which is a key uh, or I guess supposed to the new name is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Uh, uh, that is a priority of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, members of Congress representing urban and suburban areas. So together, uh, those uh, are, uh, you know, key programs that Congress considers pretty regularly, almost every five years. Sometimes it takes a little longer than they need to sort of have short-term extensions. But it's a key thing. And occasionally it has uh, a tax component to that legislation. Um, and if it does, that could be a way to advance things like uh, a rural basis boost for the low housing tax credit or the Rural Jobs Act for new markets. Uh, so that's what, one thing we're keeping an eye on. There's also uh, uh, on and th that, pro by the way, the farm program is currently uh, scheduled to expire uh, on uh, September 30th. Uh, Furthermore, also on September 30th uh, is the expiration of the Federal Aviation Administration, which, of course, is the entity that oversees all airlines and uh, uh, air traffic control, et cetera, and so forth. So if absolutely, if you're taking a plane, you need to, <laughs> that needs to happen. Whenever you pay for a ticket, there you, you'll see some charges, taxes on that. Those expire uh, on September 30th and therefore need to be renewed, and that provides uh, that makes sure that uh, legislation it will have something to do with tax, uh, and therefore, you know, you could theoretically add tax proposals too. But the most likely one are the annual spending bills, um, because Congress does have a long-standing approach to tying together funding the federal government and then adding a year-end uh, tax bill to get country ready for the tax filing season the following. Uh, you know, uh, January through April. Uh, and so we're, we're open to you know, look at all these various potential opportunities. We don't, we don't care what is the vehicle, whatever is, is the best, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, pursue it. But I think the, the highest priority items where we think there's the greatest support are for the low income housing tax credit is like increasing the 9% allocations, lowering the productivity bond financing uh, test. And if there's, you know, potential for more than beyond that, maybe some, some basis boost, uh, 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 provisions, you know, we do think that there's a possibility that the neighborhood homes, uh, credit could be authorized also along with that, uh, may not be the full permanent version. They may do it on a temporary basis. Actually, the same thing applies for lowering the productivity bond financing threshold that might have to be, 
uh, on a temporary or phase in uh, basis uh, uh, due to budget constraints. Um, and, you know, perhaps there's a room for, uh, you know, ex ex making permit the new markets tax credit. You know, the earlier we are able to do this, the less costly it will be to enact that. And, you know, cost always is a key consideration uh, for, for tax legislation. And maybe there will be an opportunity for historic tax credit uh, proposals or, or opportunity zone uh, incentives. We know that there are uh, you know, it is Senator Tim Scott's number one priority to make sure uh, something on up to these zones advances. And, and there's, you know, key support for that as well. So thank you for that overview. Kind of a bit of a wrap up. But before we wrap up completely, if you could run through, we mentioned various working groups, maybe you could brief for our listeners, the various never got working groups, and they're open for folks to join. So I'd encourage listeners to think about joining uh, one or more of the working groups. Uh, and then also, Peter, if you could just run through our conference schedule for the balance of the year, or at least for a portion of the coming months, uh, so listeners can be aware of some conferences that they want to come and learn more, you know, meet you and me in person, as well as learn more about what's happening in Washington, D.C., and more about these various incentives, as well as a network and potentially enjoy the city where we're hosting them. Absolutely. So uh, we uh, have our local housing tax credit working group that actually is also having its meeting, uh, uh, you know, later this month. Uh, so on on June twentieth. So if you want to uh, reach out and consider uh, joining before in advance of that meeting, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we also have, and you had a guest recently on the podcast. To talk about this, our Ingle Limits uh, working group. We hope to actually, uh, you know, again further our conversation with uh, key HUD policymakers at our next uh, meeting in early July. For that, uh, we have our uh, New Markets Tax Credit working group meeting coming up uh, uh, pretty soon, later this month, uh, and we continue to sort of advance uh, our proposals with uh, Treasury there. And we also have the Opportunity Zone uh, uh, working group. Um, and then lastly, we do also have a neighborhood homes tax credit working group, as I mentioned. Uh, it's, uh, we don't have a meeting for that until uh, September, um, but uh, uh, if you are interested in joining, we're more than happy to uh, give you the resources that we've already done for previous meetings and uh, you know, update you on the status of that as well. And actually, before you talk about the conferences, let me just note, we also have a GAP working group, which deals with financial reporting for investments in tax credits. So it's indirectly tax credit related, but it's very impactful for investors uh, and the impact that the gap, the public accounting for these investments, how you have to report it on your financial statements affects the value and the price. Uh, many uh, publicly traded companies will pay for the equity investments. So with that, maybe moving to conferences. Yeah, and that working group, by the way, was very key in getting a change through the Financial Accounting uh, Standards Board uh, or earlier this year. So uh, certainly it, uh, that working group paid off uh, uh, to a large extent already this year. You know, shout out to Brad Elf, who leads that group. Indeed. Proud to call him my partner. Yeah, and Brad also leads the new market. So he's really he's one of our, uh, our, our stars in the working group uh, leads here. Um, and for conferences, of course, as we mentioned, again, to remind folks this week, uh, this Thursday and Friday, we have our uh, uh, 2023 Spring New Markets Tax Credit Conference, which you know features the House Ways and Means Committee Chairman James Smith. Uh, and then it, starting the fall uh, circuit, we have uh, our uh, 2023 Housing Tax Credit and Bonds uh, Conference uh, in New Orleans on September 28th and 29th. Uh, and then uh, we have our uh, annual historic tax credit conference in Charlotte uh, on October 12th and 13th. And then uh, the last uh, one I'll mention for the moment uh, is our Opportunity Zone Summit uh, here in Washington, D.C. on uh, November 1st. And then as I mentioned earlier, the Rural Energy Tax Credit Conference, Tax Incentives Conference will be uh, November 2nd and 3rd in Washington, D.C. And we also have uh, an affordable housing conference in Las Vegas uh, at the uh, uh, beginning of December. 
So with that, let me just thank you, Peter. I will include your contact information in these show notes so listeners can reach out to you if they have specific questions or they want to hire you for various services that you can provide. And please do stick around for our off mic section. We'll get to ask you for some uh, fun off topic recommendations and words of wisdom. I will note for next week, uh, next week, our current plan is to discuss affordable housing and investing in joint venturing with nonprofit developers of affordable rental housing. There are key issues that you have to deal with from a tax perspective. If you have a nonprofit a general partner in a long term tax credit transaction, and we'll just run through some of the key issues you want to be sure that you're mindful of. And I expect to have my partner, Lance Smith, as a guest. And if you have any questions that you think we should cover in that episode, please email me at cpas at novacom.com. Now I'm pleased to reach our off mic section where I get to drift away from more directly tax incentive and development matters and get to ask Peter for some fun off topic recommendations in various areas or for him to share a few bits of his words of wisdom. And my first question for you, Peter is what's one lesson your job has taught you that everyone should learn at some point in their life? And I'll presume it's probably the earlier point in their life they learn it, the better. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, my, I, 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 you've been very kind to have me uh, on this podcast uh, many times in the past. I feel like I've, I've given my various advice on various things, various topics you've had. Uh, uh, several times, um, and it's, so uh, I actually uh, wanted to engage with my kids on this podcast, and um, I've got a daughter uh, is actually uh, this week is having our big exam week, and she said uh, uh, that she wanted me to, to to bring that up, and I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to say I'm really proud of her this year. She has done really, really well, and she studied very, very hard for this week. And I'm thinking about you this this week, uh, Emma. It's my her name's Emma, uh, and I'm wishing her good luck. I'm sending her all the good vibes uh, for her to do well. Uh, t- today is the first day she had her, uh, you know, set of exams. That uh, uh, you know, it's a pretty rigorous uh, um, program she's in, uh, and she's performed well. And so I'm, I'm sending all good vibes on her, and then. My son, of course, didn't want to get, you know, he, he's he's uh, uh, younger, uh, um, so he's not taking exams this week. Uh, but he did want me to, to bring up the fact that, you know, dinosaurs are his key thing. He's still uh, at age ten, uh, uh, really into dinosaurs. You could ask him about any particular dinosaur out there. Uh, his favorite one is Spinosaurus, uh, and he we wanted to uh, make sure. Uh, uh, that uh, I mentioned that as uh, 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 one of the things that I, I'm really proud of his knowledge about dinosaurs as well. Um, he's he's really it's, it's amazing uh, all the various obscure dinosaurs that you've never heard of. Europosaurus, he knows all about him and can tell you all sorts of details. And and uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of his knowledge of that as well. So excuse me for going off script, Mike. Well, no, I think you were, you were on script. Uh, I asked what's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life. And it would be, I guess it would be that include children, uh, in your work, uh, activities, uh, as best you can to make a part of your entire life, not just your own life. Indeed. I, they, you know, I think it's important to have a good, I mean, I, maybe this is the, the piece of advice, having that good work life balance is important. I mean, I'm very invested in working on public policy because I think it can do tremendous things uh, and uh, you can help a lot of people. But I think it's also important not to get your family. And uh, I know they, they uh, when I got gone off on these conferences and I'm not around, uh, it, it's important for me to make sure to make time for them. Uh, uh, um, and, and this is one of the key ways uh, um, I'm always uh, wanting to try to help make sure they're prepared for school and prepared for things. Uh, and, uh, 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 I'm, I'm proud of their efforts to, to, to follow through there. So thank you for that. And last time you were on the podcast, 
you referenced a book that you were reading, which I ended up pulling up uh, and read as well. And feel free to remind our listeners that the back book title. But beyond that, is there a book, TV show, or podcast that you've enjoyed recently that you would recommend to me and or our listeners? You know, there are so many podcast courses. Tax Credit Tuesday, like, uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, uh, and the, the book, by the way, I mentioned previously is Deacon King Kong, uh, which uh, you know is this, is a it's a well regarded novel. Uh, James McBride is the author, and it sort of combined uh, the you know the ability of a, of a good uh, book of fiction with set in the context of affordable housing. So you kind of I was able to to uh, uh, to to mix uh, and match. You know, I, you know, I, I read things that are relevant for work like you know matthew desmond's evicted or or his more recent book on poverty uh but i also enjoy you know fiction as well to sort of uh make sure that you you, you get do things outside of work to stimulate your brain uh um that uh, uh doesn't necessarily have a direct connection uh of what you're doing and, and i actually my wife is an incredible reader uh and i i rely on her advice uh, on, uh, uh, you know, books that she's reading. Uh, she's always got very interesting things, uh, going on. Um, you know, but prefer podcast, I guess the one thing I, I, I've listened to this in the past, but I recently picked up, but Freakonomics is always one of I found, you know, excellent, uh, uh, podcast to, you know, investigate a wide variety of, you know, interesting topics that involve, uh, economics. It's just, it's, they've had, uh, stories on, investment they send stories on housing uh and uh it's, it's, it's been going on for many many years you can hear it on the radio as well as as a podcast uh so uh i've always i guess that's the one i, I uh mentioned uh, uh uh for you on the here on this podcast no thank you i definitely am a fan of freakonomics the book and the podcast maybe it's because of my economics undergraduate degree but I definitely enjoy the way in which they can observe phenomena and develop a, not some ways a microeconomics explanation as to what's ha why what is happening is happening. And most of the time it's a set of factors and causal relationships that you're not, that are not readily identifiable. <laughs> and then they make efforts to, to actually research it and show statistically, uh, what is happening and then explain some of the causality behind what's happening. Is that a decent description? Would you say the freaking yep. approach? <laughs> yes. I think that's, that's a very good explanation of it. Great. Thank you, Peter. And to our listeners, I'm Mike Novogratik. Thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and company LLP. Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes. You can find related links referenced in this podcast in our show notes at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast. Novogratik and Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.